Hi everyone, hope you're all keeping well. keeping well so today we're going to be looking at soloing which I'm really excited about I can't wait to get stuck into with you all hi Peter hi Angela just going to bring a few of your comments on screen hi David hope you're keeping well over there mate hi Esther bonjour <laughs> fantastic I hope you're all keeping well um oh hi Linda I didn't spot you there <laughs> you're doing well see you tomorrow um so today we're going to be looking at soloing. Um, this is going to be kind of like your first tentative steps into soloing. So hopefully it'll be something for everyone. Um, for people that already know how to use scales and solos, we're going to look at some really interesting concepts. Quite a lot of the time in terms of soloing on any instrument, we concentrate so much on scales and notes that we forget about loads of the important things like rhythm and space and phrasing and all that kind of thing. So we're going to dig into all that good stuff, which would be um, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Um, oh, but buffering problems it always seems to happen for the first like two minutes, doesn't it? And then I think my computer catches up with itself. Hi, Hilka. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hope you're doing well. Oh, you're on a bus journey. Oh, cool. <laughs> nice. Nice. Where have you been, Steve? Hi, Danya. Good to see you. Hope you're not sick of me. Danya had a brilliant lesson this morning. Well, I thought it was brilliant. She did amazing. So, good. Um, so, if you haven't already got them, don't forget that you can get your worksheets. Um, they're available via the link in the description. Um... Don't worry, Jeff. I think the buffering will sort itself out in a minute. Let's just give it a minute. Hi, John. Hope you're keeping well, mate. So yeah, you can um, you can get the links in the um, in the description to the worksheets. There's quite a few today. I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail with things, um, ways to solo, different scales. We're going to look at major, minor scales, pentatonics, blues, all that goodness. Um, I'm going to actually put it into kind of usable um, shapes on the fretboard to make it easy for you as well. And I'm going to show you some tricks and cheats to kind of make it a bit easier. Um, William, I think just just whack your volume up on your PC because I think I'm at max here. Um, I can turn it up a little bit, but I have to be a bit careful because it goes in the red when I'm playing otherwise. Hi, Richard. Hope you're keeping well. Oh, hey, Jude. <laughs> So, um, as I say, worksheets are available. Um, one of the first descriptions, to um, one of the first comments I put in today is that I've got a little extra sheet for you today. When I was mucking about for one of the solos, I thought that uh, something that would really help you. So I, I've done a very rough and ready handwritten sheet, um, which I'm going to put up on the screen, but you'll be able to get at any point. You'll be able to go back and and look it up it's not too complex you could probably do it without that sheet anyway but it's it's in the description now it's a, it's because i put it in last minute it's completely free so you can add it to the worksheets if you like so um yeah cool <laughs> steve's my teacher mate from top north uh up in newcastle so teaching chesterley street gosh i did a geography degree steve and i don't know where that is that's terrible <laughs> there we go right so Let's have a look at how to solo. We're going to go into loads of depth with this one. I think today of all days, I think it's really crucial that you guys ask lots of questions. So if I appear at all distracted, I'll try not to too much. It's because I'm looking at your comments coming through. It's going to be a little bit of music theory today. I'm not going to try and overcomplicate things. In fact, hopefully I'm going to click a few light bulbs on and then we'll do the opposite. But any question you've got of any of the sheets or any of the teaching today, just comment live and I can address it there to help you. So quite often you might think you've got a question you're too embarrassed to ask. And then you find out after you've asked it that everyone was thinking the same thing. And sometimes I might have just forgotten to tell you something. So, um, yeah, ask away. Good. So when we think about soloing, 
we've got lots of different ways that we can create a solo. So we're going to concentrate on the third one today, which is using one scale over a whole piece of music. Why are we concentrating on that one? Well, first of all, it's the easiest way of doing it, right? We've got one scale that stays stationary. You can play the same five, six or seven notes or more um, over the whole piece of music, which is a lot easier, a lot easier than other ways. But also it's one of the most common ways to solo as well. So it's loads of guitarists um, that you'll see, um, you know, even people like Clapton, they're using the same pentatonic scales as we're going to look at today. So that's that's why we're doing this. But there are other ways to solo as well. So back in the jazz day, people used to use chord tones to solo. So what's that mean? Well, when you play a C chord, for instance, it's made up of three or more notes, isn't it? A C chord's made up of a C, an E, a G, and another C. And then perhaps another chord that you might play in that progression, a D minor, it's made up of D, F, and A. And early soloists would actually play those tones. So when uh, someone's playing a D minor, they would be soloing, using those chord tones. Then if the next, if the rhythm player went on to a G7, they would use the chord tones from G7 and then finally C, they would use those chord tones. They wouldn't hold chord shapes down because that would stop it being quite interesting. So, um, so, but that that's a basic, that's, that's one way of um, creating a solo. It is a really lovely way to solo because you can sometimes you can hear the changes. You can actually you can almost hear the chords just from those notes being picked underneath. So that's a really lovely way to solo. And I think at some point I might do a workshop on that because I think that would be really fun. right? The other way is to use a modal. And I'm just going to show you what I mean by that. So modes are just kind of scales from within scales so for instance in the key of c if you play the key of c starting from c we call it the ionian scale if you play the same thing starting from d we call it the dorian and so on and so forth e is the phrygian <laughs> have to think about that for a minute and so on and so forth and each of those types of modes relates to um, a particular chord. So over a D minor, they would use D Dorian. Over a G7, they'd use G Mixolydian. And over C, they'd use C Ionian. But if that all sounded too complicated, panic not, because we're not going to do that. OK, so the difficulty with that is you have to change either the mode or the scale you use for every chord. And if a chord progression goes, that means you have about 0 0.8 seconds <laughs> of a scale on each one, which is why people like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie were just absolute geniuses. Let's concentrate on number three then. So we're going to look at using a single stationary scale over each one. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at each of the scales that we can use to solo with. We're going to look at major scales, minor scales, pentatonics and blues scales. And also we're going to look at the kind of advantages and disadvantages of all of them. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Jude. <laughs> Good to see you. So let's first of all think about which scales we can use and then I'll explain what they are and go into a lot more detail. So the first thing we can do to solo over a piece is use a major or a minor scale. So say I was playing a piece of music in the key of C. I've done a prepared piece of music on my iPad. It's just me mucking about in the uke. It's nothing special but just so you can get an idea. I'm going to give you some links later on to some backing tracks on YouTube you can use to practice all this stuff. Um, but say I had a piece of music in the key of C and it's in the key of C major, I could use the C major scale to solo over the top. So if I just play that scale with it, it will sound something like this. Let me know if the music's loud enough. That's, it needs to come up, doesn't it, in volume. That's soloing, that's the C major scale. 
paper is still in the KFC. So, that would be using the key of C major to solo over a progression in the key of C major, right? It's that simple. If I was using a, um, a piece of music in the key of C minor, I'd use the C minor natural scale to solo over the top. And we are going to do this. Don't panic. Don't think, oh my gosh, I don't know all the notes. I'm going to teach them to you. But first of all, I just want to give you a bit of a background of the advantages and the disadvantages. So the brilliant thing about using a full major or minor scale is you have at least seven notes to choose from. So the C major scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then we go back to C. Seven notes or eight if I include the octave C. So it gives me a really good range um, to solo from. Um, it has more kind of character than scales that are just based on say five notes because you've got a little bit more flavour, you've got more spices to put in. The trouble that comes up with major and minor scales is that there are certain chords in the key which clash with two of the notes from each of those scales. Now I'm trusting you've all got your ukuleles on you. <laughs> this is an experiment because I'm not going to be able to hear you. But all I want you to do on your ukulele is put your finger on the second fret of the A string, okay? And just pick it. That's a B note. Okay. Do it for me if you've got your uke. Second fret of the A string and pick away. Now, because that B note is in a G7 chord, when I play a G7 chord, it will match, okay? I'll play G7, you hit that B note, and it shouldn't sound too horrible, as long as we're all in tune. In fact, you can actually hear the B note in the G7. Okay. Now, try playing a C note, that's the third fret of the A string. Just keep that pinging. Try playing that as I play a G7. Can you hear two of the notes clashing, clashing with each other? Um, let's think of another example. Um, let's play, say, let's do, yeah, let's do an E note, the third string down on your ukulele. Give it a ping. Now, if I play that at the same time as C, sounds okay, right? But if I was playing an F chord and you hit that E note, try it probably doesn't sound that great. Our ears hate to hear the sound of one note that's um, half a step away from another, like the next note down. In fact, if I play an E note here and an F at the same time, how horrible does that sound, right? I could do a similar thing with that B and C I was telling you about. I could play a B here and I'll do an open C. Not great, they don't sound great. So what guitarists and all stringed instruments and even classical instruments realised over the years was that there are two notes from every major scale and every minor scale that clash with certain chords from the key. In the key of C, we'll go into this in a lot more detail in a minute, so don't panic about this. In the key of C, it's the um, fourth scale degree, the F, and the seventh scale degree, G, A, the B. So in any, every major scale, the fourth and the seventh notes clash with some of the chords. So clever clogs and uh, musicians worked out something called the pentatonic scale, where they literally would just play through the major scale, say C major, and they would leave out no F, the F, the fourth one, and the seventh one. Now, if you play all the natural chords that come up in the key of C, none of those notes will clash against any of the chords. So I call them a friendly scale, and we're going to use these loads today. Because as long as you put your finger in the right place, which I know is harder than easier said than done, um, you won't be playing the wrong note, which is really, really what we want. 
Now, the only trouble with with the pentatonic scales is that they lack a little bit of their character from the major scales. Sometimes it's nice to have those extra notes to play with and take a bit of a risk and have slightly dissonant sounds sometimes. So they can sound a little bit safe, which is which which I guess is the, the biggest critique of pentatonic scales. But I think as you're learning to solo, that's going to be really key. That's going to be one of your key scales to learn. And I'm going to teach them to you in just a second. The other type of scale that you see a lot on um, stringed instruments, particularly fretted instruments, are something called blues scales. And that's a minor pentatonic scale, which you'll know what, it, what one of those is in a minute. Plus that flatted fifth note. And as soon as you play the blues scale, it just sounds like the blues. Um, the only negatives about the blues scale is sometimes it can sound a little bit cliche. There's six notes rather than seven that you get with a major and minor scales. Plus, you can only really, I would say, play them with rhythm and blues, blues, some jazz, that kind of thing. If you play them over a really happy um, major key pop song, it'll sound a bit, ooh, won't sound so great. So... I just want to give you a background of the three main type of scales that we're going to look at. Um, and what we'll do next is we'll look at them in a lot more detail. So let's take our major scale first. So the thing you've got to remember with all these scales uh, is that they're completely arbitrary. You don't get um, a night, a nightingale has a beautiful song, but it doesn't go It doesn't sing in a particular scale. Um, it might sound really melodious, but it doesn't stick to a note. We've created these arbitrary scales. They're just a way of dividing notes up that we think sound nice. Um, one of the most important scales that's been used throughout history is the major scale. It's your Do, Re, Mi one. Okay. It's the one that most people recognise when they hear a scale. And major scales tend to be played over major songs. Um, so if you had a pop song in the key of C major, you would probably play a C major scale. And what I like to do is learn the intervals of these scales. You don't have to remember these because you've got the sheets and if you haven't, you can download them, <laughs> point in the right direction up there. But every scale has a series of intervals. A half step just means you go up one step to the next note in the chromatic scale. That's just the scale of all the notes you could possibly play. What I mean by that is if you go from C to C sharp, that would be a half step. Okay. If you were to go C, C sharp, D, that would be a whole step. And every scale is made up from these holes and half steps. And if you only remember this one thing today, this blew my mind when I remembered this, so I could create any major scale. We've got this kind of mnemonic, if you like. Can you see at the top there? Let me make it big. Our major scale can be rem rem remembered as whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. So that means we start with C, we go up a whole step, C, C sharp, D, that gives us our next one. Then we go up a half step, uh, sorry, another whole step, the D, D sharp, E, that gives us E. Then we go up a half step, there's no E sharp, you just have to learn that in music. So that half step gives us F. We go up a whole step, which is two frets. Every two frets is a whole step, gives us G. Another whole step gives us A, G, G sharp, A. We go up another whole step, A, A sharp, B. And then finally we go up a half step at the end, just to check, we should end up back to the, back to the start. So we've got whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. How can you remember that? This is my favourite thing in the world at the moment. <laughs> Why won't he wear white when hot? That's all you've got to remember. Just put it in your brain. Why won't he wear white when hot? If you can do that, you can construct any major scale in the world. In the world. You just start from a note and go up whole or half steps. So I won't do the whole thing, but G major scale, scale, I could start from G. I could go up a half, a whole step, gives us A. Another whole step gives us B. 
a half step gives us C. And you can work out your own major scales like that. Cool, huh? Why won't he wear white when hot? <laughs> and every major scale has a certain amount of sharps or flats in it, just because of the intervals. We're going to concentrate on the key of C because it doesn't have any sharps and flats in it, so it's the easiest. Okay, right, here's where the fun bit comes in. Don't worry, we're actually going to play some ukulele. Um, so grab your ukes. Let's start with the C major scale, the easy peasy lemon squeezy one. Okay, you can look at the dots on the screen at the moment, but just follow me. I'll tell you where to put your fingers. Okay, let's go to the close up and bring it in close so you can see. I'm just picking all these notes with the with my thumb down here, roughly where the body meets the neck. But you can use your fingers; it doesn't matter for today. It's all about the notes at this end. Okay. So in the C major scale, we have open C, that's your second string down open. We have a D on your second fret. E is third string down open. F is first fret. G is third fret. A is open. B is second fret. And C is third fret. Now I know loads of you can probably do that off by heart okay and that's totally cool but some of you that will be new okay now this is where the magic starts to happen again it's one of those little things if you can just remember this from today it'll really help you playing if you don't already know it I want you to play exactly the same scale but anytime we have an open note like C where we're not putting a finger on a fret I actually want you to put your finger on the string behind the nut so you can pretend that that the zero fret is here, okay? So we're gonna play C here. We're gonna use our third finger to play D on the second fret. We're gonna put our finger here for E, open. First fret F, third fret G. A here, open. Second fret B, third fret C. Now here's the magic, this is why I got you to do this. If you have a look at the diagrams on your sheet, I'll bring them up really giant and big on screen. No, mouse, I wanna do the opposite of that. Sorry guys, sometimes my mouse goes a bit AWOL. I'll put it over there. Can you see these dots where it says reentrant? Reentrant is just a fancy name for high G, okay? The square just rep represents the name of the scale. So because we're starting from low C, this is the C major scale, okay? And by getting you to put your finger behind the nut, notice that we have the pattern that's shown on the screen. We start the square here. We go up two frets higher, gives us the next note here, D. We go back to here. Then we go up one note. We go up two notes. We go back here. We go up two notes, not notes, sorry, two frets. And then we go up one fret, gives us C. So we have the pattern. There, okay, of the C major scale. The linear just shows you how to do the same pattern. If you've got a low G, you can start from C up here um, at the fifth fret on low G and you get the same pattern. Just helps those that have got a low G to have another option, okay? Here's the absolute magic. And when I learnt this, this was one of those ah, hallelujah moments. That gives you the key of C, which you can play over any song that's in the key of C, right? Say you had a song that is in the key of F. Wow, these scales are totally movable. If you think of it as a shape, we can do that shape that's written out that we just did, starting from the fifth fret of the C string, for example. The fifth fret of the C string is an F, C, D, E, F, okay? And we just carry on doing that shape, look. So I'm starting from the fifth fret of the C string. I hit that, gives me F. I go up two, gives me G. Don't worry too much about the notes for now, just get the pattern. I go here, gives me A. Little gap, big gap. Back to where I started, big gap little gap. Now I have the F major scale. F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, F. So that scale is movable. 
And wherever you start that square from, we start from an F, that's the name of the scale. So if I was playing a song in the key of F, I just do that pattern, gives me all the notes I need to play in the key of F. If I was playing in the key of D, I would start it from a D note, that could be the second fret of the C string. Just try playing through exactly the same shape again. This time it will be two, four, two, three, five, two, four, five. And you can take that up and down the neck and that gives you all the keys you'll ever want to play in. So isn't that cool, right? That's an easy win right from the off. So you only need one scale shape. It's nice to extend it further, but to get started, you only need one scale shape to solo in every key. So let's just have a muck about with that. Sorry about this, doing that kind of big little thing again. Let's try playing, um, I've, I've prepared a backing track in the key of C. Um, first of all, let's just play through the scale, okay, just up from the lowest note to the start. Let's do the C major scale. You can either do it the normal way or the shape starting from behind the fret, right? So if I put on this backing track, hopefully you can hear it. Just join me playing through the scale. Okay. For C, D, E. come backwards. Let's go up again. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and back. Sounds nice even just playing the scale, doesn't it? Now, all we need to do to solo, obviously I'm going to teach you a lot more detail about um, tone and articulation phrasing and all that later. But all you have to do to play in the key of C and using a C major scale is those notes and muck about with the order. So I'm going to stick with exactly that. to do is I'd like to just play that backing track and I'd like you to have an experiment yourself. No worries Lisa, catch up with you in a bit. There we go. So I'll put it to the start. You have a little play along. Let me know how you got on that with that. Give us a thumbs up or a comment. Let me know how you're getting on. Now, um, the in terms of like getting a rhythm for your solo and what note choices you make, we'll go into that in more detail in a little bit. But that's just to give you one, um, one major scale to solo from. Here's the magic, right? Let's put it to a test, what I was telling you a second ago. Um, let's have a look at playing uh, a solo in the key of F. So say you had a song, it was in the key of F, and you wanted to solo over it, you could just use the F major scale. And remember, we looked at that, that was the um, same as the C major scale, but we start from the fifth fret, okay, fifth fret of the C string. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play some chords in the key of F and I'm going to do exactly the same thing. If you feel confident enough to join me in the scale going up and down, give it a try. Four, five, uh, sorry, five, seven, five, six, eight, five, seven, eight. If that's too much for now, just pick the dots on one string. So for instance, on the E string, five, six, and eight. And try just... There's a surprising amount you can do with three notes. Just have a listen. This is a song in the key of F. Three, four. Exactly the same shape I was playing in C, but starting from F. See how they all fit? Whoops, <laughs> that was a bad one. I got the wrong note. See, I go wrong. So I'm just noodling away. I realise there. So you can make all of that. You can make all of those notes in the key of F major. They fit right in the key of F. So you can just take those scales up and down the fretboard till you find one that fits in the key. And voila, you can solo in any key. Thanks, guys. So exactly the same thing. I'm going to play some chords from the key of F. You have a try. Just have fun. Here we go. Two, three, four. another one of those cool little hopefully one of those cool little gems that will really help you in this C major scale or sorry in any major scale there are seven notes okay for example in C C D E F G A B seven notes I don't know why I was holding a fake fingers seven notes how many notes are there in the whole wide world that we can play I say the whole wide world is the Western world. In some um, in some other continents and countries, um, there are more than this amount of notes. They actually play microtonally. They put notes in between the notes we have. In the chromatic scale, that means all of the notes that we play in the Western world, all of the keys on a piano, there are 12. And you might think, hang on, there's more than 12 keys on a piano. It's just the same 12 repeated higher or lower again and again. Okay. There's seven notes in the major scale and there's 12 notes in the whole wide world. Already, statistically speaking, you're more likely to hit a right note than a wrong note because seven out of the 12 will be right. That's magic already. There's also a brilliant thing called resolution. If you hit a wrong note, as long as you correct it to a right note within a certain amount of time, it will actually still sound sweet to the ear. It's kind of a bit mind blowing like that. And loads of musicians have harnessed the power of that and they'll purposefully hit the wrong notes, discordant ones, to give it a bit of flavour and then they'll resolve that to um, the right note, if you like. The important thing for that is if you're hitting notes and they sounded wrong, you're never more than one fret away from the right note. Just move it left and right and concentrate on that. And it's really cool. I like to show people, right? Um, this is, I'll play that piece that I did in the key of C again, right? And what I'll do is I'll play every single note in the world on my ukulele. And you'll notice that every single one of them will sound okay as long as they, I resolve it. I'll show you what I mean. Nope, that's the wrong track, so here we go. 
every single note. Some of those shouldn't be working right. And that's because I'm resolving them. I'm hitting a wrong note. Here's an example in the key of C. On this string I should have C, D, E. So a C sharp's going to sound wrong and a D sharp's going to sound wrong. But as long as I pass through them quickly, they can sound really nice. And that's something I want you to experiment with. The best soloists in my mind don't just use the, the, the right notes, the notes from a major scale, they experiment. In a minute, I'm going to look at the pentatonic skills with you and we'll put this into practice. You'll have loads of fun. First of all, I just wanted to talk about minor scales. So any major key song, you would correspond with a major scale. Generally, that's just what we would do to keep it simple, okay? What about a song that's in a minor key? Well, the trouble with minor keys, and this is part of the reason I'm not gonna study them in a lot of detail today, um, is that there are actually three types of minor scales, the natural, harmonic, and the melodic. Um, scales. I'm going to concentrate on soloing in major keys just because there's no way I can squeeze this into an hour and a half but just let me show you what the minor scales are and how they come about. If you think of a minor scale as like the major scale only um, three of the notes are flatted to create an element of darkness if you like. Um, the natural minor scale is just like the major scale you can see it written down there, the C major one, uh, the C natural minor as an example. But notice the third, the sixth and the seventh notes are flatted. And that gives the scale a dark sound, right? It kind of just sounds, you tend to play it over things that are melancholic or dark or angry, right? So that's your, if you think of that as your natural minor scale, I don't, you can try and play along, but I'm, I don't want to go into too much detail. That's whiz through, but that is it in essence. Just let me pass over in two minutes, because I think some of you will find it interesting why there are two other scales. Composers had a problem with this natural minor scale, because one of the favorite things for composers to do with melodies is to take the seventh note of the scale and resolve it to the first note of the next scale. So if you think of it as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's nice when that seven leads into eight. But because the seventh note of the minor scale is a whole step or two frets away, it doesn't have the nice resolution that a B to a C has. See how that B just it wants, it begs to go to a C, right? It resolves. But a B flat doesn't. It can quite happily just sit there. So, ah, the major key has that resolution. The minor key, natural minor, doesn't. <laughs> so, basically, composers mucked about with the, with the minor scale and they changed it in a couple of ways. The first thing they did was to create something called the harmonic minor. Again, don't worry about this, it's just because a lot of people find this really fascinating. If, if, if this is too much, just make yourself a cup of tea and come back in five minutes and we'll get on to actually put, making use of it. The harmonic minor, all they did is they took the natural minor and they took that seventh note I was telling you about, the B flat in this case, and they changed it to a non-flatted seven, which just means a normal B. So the harmonic minor is the same as the natural minor. <sighs> but it has that resolution at the end. That's exactly why they did it. But then other musicians went, oh, that's rubbish because 
we get to here and there's this massive gap there's this really big gap from a flat to b a flat a b it's like it's just like yeah sorry even bigger than yeah a flat a sorry and then b flat b it's a big old gap they didn't like it so what they did is they created something called the melodic minor where they took the sixth note of the minor scale this one and instead of playing a flat they changed it to an a and then there's not a big gap and we still have that resolution So that's that's the reason um, why you have three minor scales. I just thought some of you might find it find it interesting. We are going to use the minor scale in one way when we create a minor pentatonic in a minute. Okay. So there we go. That's all the boring stuff about the minor scales out of the way. Let's have a look at your pentatonic scales, your friendly scales. These are the ones that people like Clapton, B.B. Uh, King, lo loads, even go back to like Charlie Christensen in jazz, although he used scale tones as well, um, chord tones as well. A lot of solos are created from something called the pentatonic scale. And I've already told you what it is, but let's just have a quick recap. So a pentatonic scale, pent means five, doesn't it? Like think pentagon. The pentatonic scale just takes out those two notes that clash with certain chords. Do you remember I told you earlier? That E note, that sorry, that F note clashes with the E from a C chord. They just don't sound nice together. And that was where if I play E and F at the same time, they sound horrible. And then B clashes with a C chord and some of the other chords. So pentatonic scales take out the two notes that you're most likely to play and hit a bit of discordance where it sounds kind of all right, but kind of can be a bit horrible at the same time. And these are your friends. If you're just getting into soloing, these are amazing scales to solo with, okay? Because there's only five notes and they follow a really easy pattern. So let's have a look at the first pattern. What I want you to do is, oh, thanks Esther, we've had a light bar. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to look at the C major pentatonic scale, five notes from the C major scale with the two horrible sounded ones taken out. And I'd like you to play your open notes with your finger behind the nap, just so that we can move this up and down to become other scales. So we start with C, second string down open. We go up two to D, second fret. We come back to E open. We go up quite a long way now to three. Back to A open and up to C. Now this is what I really want you to look at. It's a shape, isn't it? There's a medium sized gap, a big gap, and another big gap. If you can picture that as a shape, you can take that up and down to play all the pentatonic scales. Let's start it from D, second fret of a C string, go up two, come back to where you started, second fret, go up three, come back to where you started, go up three. Do you notice when I go up and down? It has almost like um, a flavour of the Far East. And that's because in a lot of cultures, including Japan and a lot of Chinese um, regional areas in China, not all of it, these scales were really popular. Because we've taken out the two notes that clash with things, they sound really nice to our ears. And there was a lovely music documentary of Stuart Copeland from um, The Police a few years ago on the BBC. And um, he, he didn't make the discovery, but he talked about it, that someone else had discovered it, that the pentatonic scales are the only scale that's played in almost every culture since the beginning of time. So any culture that has musical instruments tend to use the pentatonic scale. That's amazing. Every continent, all those different cultures. Just brilliant because it works. Okay. So I'm going to play that C backing track again. If you're interested and you want to create your own backing track, this one's just D minor 7. You could play D minor, followed by G7, followed by C. We call it a 2-5-1 progression. Okay. 
So we're going to play that backing track and let's just start going up and down the scales. So we'll do C first, okay? Here we go. So finger on zero. Come back down. Okay. Now you might not have hit those in exactly the same time as me, so have a go yourself. Doesn't matter how long you stay on each note for, just practice going up and down that scale. don't want to, our solos to just be going up and down, right? That would be a bit boring. So I'm going to play the backing track again. Start from somewhere else in the scale other than C. Perhaps start from that G note there. And instead of maybe just going up to the next note, maybe skip one. experiment with putting them in different orders and really simply you don't have to do anything super fancy you could get something like this just really simple just hitting a few notes just maybe practice hitting two or three notes we play that exact shape, medium size gap, big gap, big gap, what if we started it from the fifth fret of the C string? So that would look like this, wouldn't it? Five, let me come in closer. Five, seven, five, eight, five, eight. Now because we took that exact shape and we started from F, the fifth fret of the C string is F, We've got, you've guessed it, the F major pentatonic scale. And if I do that backing track in the key of F, notice the notes will fit. So again, maybe experiment mixing those notes up. Go on, have a go. question here. Why take away the F from the scale and not the E? So why take away the fourth note? Um, it's a really good question. Um, you could, the third, taking away the third note would solve some problems, um, but I think there's more clashes with the four than there is the three. But the other thing, and again, I wouldn't worry too much about this, but because the E note 
is in the um, the one chord of each key, or the, or the sorry, I should say the third note of a scale is in the first chord of a scale. So when we play C, the E is within that chord. So it's 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 the strongest chord in any key is the one chord. It's the one we use that we stay home with and everything. So it, taking away the F would make more sense than the E. The F is used in the F chord and a few others, that, which is true, but I, I think the keeping that E in the one um, works. So just think, which, you, I mean, you could experiment, but I think when you're doing these pentatonic scales, these have been um, set in stone for a long time. Just always think the fourth and the seventh. I promise it works. Okay. That's a great, that is a great question because you, you're right. If two notes are causing the same problem, why not take it away? So yeah, we go for the fourth and the, the fifth, seventh in every major key. Now to create a minor pentatonic, we do a similar thing. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail with this in terms of the theory behind it because it gets a bit heavy, but just know that a minor pentatonic scale, and this is in your sheet, you haven't got to remember it, is a is the natural minor scale with the second and sixth notes removed. You can see it there down the bottom. The reason we do that is just like the fourth and seventh clash with a lot of chords in a major key, the second and the sixth notes clash with a lot of chords in um, in the minor key. All right, so we've so a minor pentatonic scale is the minor is the mi natural minor scale with the second and sixth degrees missing. Now, quite often we'll use minor pentatonic keys to solo with in a key, in a major key. And that, that sounds like a bit mad, doesn't it? But it creates a little sense of melancholy. It makes the solo not too kind of A, B, C. Now this, again, could be a light bulb going off, but it could be one of those ah, kind of melty moments. Um, just wanted to say that every major key in the world so for instance, the key of C major has the same notes in it as a corresponding, we call it the relative minor scale. It's always, the minor one is always six above the major. So C, D, E, F, G, A. The A minor scale, believe it or not, has all the same notes in it as the C major scale. It just starts from A. So C major is C, D, E, C, A minor, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. All the same notes. I went up higher to keep it in a, in a row. All the same notes, but just starting from A. But because when you solo, you tend to come back to where you started and you, you they call it the kind of the key centre. You go back to that tonic, the, the, the note that the, names, uh, the, the key is named after. So C, C. A really nice way to solo over major key songs is to use the minor pentatonic, the relative minor pentatonic. So if you were soloing in the key, if you had a song that's in the key of C major, C, D, E, F, G, A, try using the notes from the A minor pentatonic to solo over and it will give you a really nice sound. And what I've done is I've written out the minor pentatonics in shapes up here. Okay, can you see those at the top? They look very much like the major pentatonic. I'm just going to go for F to give you an example, right? You know how the major pentatonic is medium gap, big gap, big gap. Well, the minor pentatonic is big gap, starting one over, little gap, little gap. They look so similar, so you just got to remember in terms of the shapes that the major pentatonic is little, big, big, and the minor pentatonic is big, little, little. And you'll soon remember these shapes. They, they sound, they sound really, um, they, they work really well. Let's put that to use. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play that backing track in the key of F again. And we could use the F major pentatonic to solo of that and that would sound nice but let's use the relative minor pentatonic f g a b c d okay 
the relative minor pentatonic of F is D minor. If that all made your brain go, ah, don't panic. Just get used to using this pentatonic shape and then I'll explain later on where you can find resources so you know which one to use, okay? But let's try that pentatonic shape at the start going from D, second fret of the C string, right? So we're going to do D here, second fret. We're going to go way up to five because the first one's a big gap, right? We're going to come back to three, medium gap to five, three, five. So D, we're going to go up here to five, over here to G, up here to A, C and D again. Okay. Those notes from the D minor pentatonic scale are the same notes as the F major pentatonic scale. But it's a relative minor and because we start from D it gives it a bit more of a melancholic feel. Have a listen. I'll do that key of F and I'll do the major pentatonic first and then the D minor pentatonic. Have a listen. F major pentatonic. I'll do exactly a similar thing but in the D minor pentatonic. difference but the D minor pentatonic is slightly more melancholic. I'm going to let you have a go. I'm going to take a quick swig of drink whilst you're doing it and you have an experiment. Try that D. Two, five, three, five, three, five. Go on, have fun, have fun. Remember to find the minor pentatonic in any major key you just count up to six okay the other way is if you've got circle of fifths I've talked about this in some of my other lessons don't panic if you don't know what that is but for those that have seen it the inner wheel on the circle of fifths is your minor um, your relative minor I'm trying to see if I've got one handy I don't think I oh, let me see no I haven't got one handy but yeah the circle of fifths has all the major keys around the outside and all the minor keys in the inside. Just it's a good resource for finding the relative minor if you wanted to do it. Okay. Um, this is only an answer for Richard. He'd ask a question, are there chords in the pentatonic scale? You can create diatonic chords from the pentatonic scale, um, Richard, just using those notes, but they sound a bit weird. So people would tend to just use the chords from the major scale. All right. So um, yeah, you can do, but they sound weird, so don't do it. <laughs> okay, so that gives us some really useful scales to use. Now, at the end of the sheet here, at the end of the next sheet, is a really important diagram that I want you to kind of make, um, make notes from. No worries, Jeff. I hope you've got some little nuggets there that were useful. These are kind of a, a kind of a simple way to know which which scales to use. So a major pentatonic scale you would tend to use over major key pop songs. All right. So if a song is in the key of C major, use the C major pentatonic scale. The minor pentatonic scale you would use for minor key songs. So if a song is in key, if a song is in the key of C minor, you would use the C minor pentatonic scale and it would sound nice. And the other thing that we just looked at was you can use the relative major key songs. So if a song is in C, 
you could use the A minor pentatonic scale because it's a relative minor. So a lot to take in, I know. So don't sweat that. Remember, you can watch this back as many times. You can ask questions. You can email me, Matt, at the Uke Room if you're really stuck with something. I'm going to show you um, one final scale quickly, just because it will send a few light bulbs showing you what it is. And then I'm going to get on something really important. And those that have lasted this long, even if you can't watch it tonight, please come back to the last bit of the video because it's really important, I promise. There's one other type of scale called the blues scale that is used over blues, rock and roll, R&B, jazz blues, things like that. And I just wanted to show you what it is because some people might find it interesting. A blues scale is the minor pentatonic. So if we were playing over a, a song which is C blues, C, it's blues in the key of C, so it might be C, F7, and C, that kind of thing. We would use the minor blue scale and a minor blue scale would mean a C minor pentatonic scale with a flatted fifth so we take that pentatonic shape we were doing and we just have one more note that one there there it is and that's a really common thing in a blues that flatted fifth note you can see the shape down there it looks the same as the major, uh, sorry, it looks the same as a minor pentatonic, but we've just got that one extra note, which gives it a real, as soon as you hear it, it sounds like the blues, doesn't it? So just before we do the last bit, let's play some 12 bar blues. I'll play it in the background and experiment with that one. So it could be. Notes how it fits. You could muck it up, muck it up, mix it. I love the sound of the blues too, dude. Doesn't it sound great? Have an experiment. Go on, try playing through that blues scale. See how far you can shrink it down to nothing. What if a song was in the key of G and we wanted to play G blues? We would take exactly that pattern and we would start it from a G note. That could be way up at the seventh fret. Exactly the same pattern, blues and G. from exactly the same pattern higher up the fretboard starting from seven go on i know you want to go right put it back to start it's gonna be seven ten eight ten eight ten have a little try have a little try was a heck of a lot to take in in one lesson all those scales right but all you've got to remember is what was on the last page this one here and then look them up and you might think oh where am I going to find all these scales well they're in your worksheets they're in these worksheets aren't they so just experiment find some songs that are in a major key try playing the corresponding major pentatonic find some songs that are in a minor key Try playing the minor pentatonic. Find some songs that are in a major key. Try using the relative minor pentatonic. Find some songs that are in a blue that are blues and use the blue scale. Just experiment. Now, 
I'm racing ahead a little bit because we're running out of time and I want to cover something really, really crucially important in soloing. So, like I said, if you've got a go, please come back to this if you can, because this is super duper important. It's almost as important as the actual notes that you use to play a piece of music. I kind of took this from a book, not this exact thing. I've, I've kind of worked out this myself, but some of the some of the um, concepts here I took from a book by Victor Wooten called The Music Lesson, which is really good on getting you to think about how to play music. And there's a lot more that makes up a good solo than just the notes, right? So let's look at each one and I'll show you how you can kind of muck about them. And I give you some tips which will make your solos sound nice. Let's pick one particular, um, let's pick one particular scale to use, um, which most people probably know better than any other. We'll do either the C major penta C major scale, which is just C, D, E, F. Or if you want to make it pentatonic, just miss out the F and the um, B. So that'd be. Okay. You'll see major pentatonic. We'll use that just to kind of highlight these things so you can you can practice along. So first of all, um, we've got our note choices. Now our notes come from the scale, don't they? I'm just finding, just give me one second guys, because I've lost an important sheet, uh, which has all my notes on it. Where's it gone? There it is. Can't get the staff nowadays, can you? I should have an auto cue. So, I made lots of notes because I want to talk to you in quite a lot of detail about this. So, note choice. This kind of comes a bit back to Esther's um, question when she was asking what notes. They can sound a little bit random. So when you're playing um, a scale to solo, have an experiment with making sure you don't just play up and down it. I'll give you an example. So let's go to a backing track in the key of C. If I just play up the scale, it's a bit boring, isn't it? Even if I rhythm it up a bit. Sounds a bit up and down. So a good way to get yourself to avoid just playing um, scales up and down are to try and find intervals that sound nice. So maybe the interval of a fifth is really lovely. So you might play the C and jump straight to the fifth note in a scale. Okay. And then maybe let's jump to, let's go to the second. We'll go back to the second D. So we could play C, C, G, D. Let's see if that sounds nice. C, G, D. Here we go. For C, then G, and then D. Oh, that sounds nice, doesn't it? Let's try a high C, and then maybe back to G. So I could do that again. C, G. D, maybe a high C, and back to G. So that gives you that gives you some a, a really nice idea of how you can just practice with intervals. Try not to just go up and down. Try and jump around a bit. A way to experiment with that to make it sound nice is to kind of see if you can sing some melodies in your head. So, so I was playing these chords. And you're just humming along anything that you wanted. Some people find this hard, some people find it naturally. So it could be like... And then see if you can find those notes you sung. Oh, mine's a bit higher, I started a bit higher, I'll, I'll do it in octave lower. Da 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 da. Something like that, wasn't it? And then see if you can rep replicate it live against the track. There was something like that, wasn't it? 
doesn't it? So you can actually try to kind of invent melodies in your head first and then play them. And there's a lot of um, jazz players that say you should sing your solos as you play, like bum, ba, ba, da, bum, and try and replicate that with your notes. That can take a lot of time, but it's a really good way. So, um, another question. Um, for a blues in C, do you use blues scale in C or blues scale in A minor? Oh, that's a great question. There is something called the major blues scale, but we tend to use what we just call the blues scale. So if you were to look up the blues scale, literally just those words in a book, it would actually be giving you C minor blues. So if a blues song is in the key of C, you would use the C blues scale, which actually, actually is the C minor pentatonic with the flatted fifth. So, yeah, just think of it as one scale, all right? So if it's songs in the key of C, look up the C blues scale, all right? Um, rather, than, rather than the A minor one. I know it sounds crazy, but <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? So the other thing that I want you to do in terms of the note choice is experiment with chromatic, to chromatic notes, okay? So what are chromatic notes? They're just the notes in between the notes that you play from a scale. So if I was playing the C pentatonic again, C, D, E, G, there's a heck of a lot of notes, isn't there, in between E and G. And I could play them all, I could go E, F, F sharp, G. And remember my tip earlier, as long as you resolve to the correct note, it will sound nice. And it will actually sound nicer than just using the pentatonic. Show you know what I mean? Have a listen. So pentatonic. If I fill out some of the notes in between, have a listen to this. I could do some here. Just as an example, what I'm getting at is don't be afraid to play the wrong notes and resolve them to the right notes. It's a really good way to experiment to see what sounds nice to you and it gives your solos a really nice bit of flavour. So in terms of note choice, you start with a particular scale or an idea of a scale and then add some of those chromatic notes in and try to make those intervals big, just don't play up and down. The next thing is really crucially important. If you've seen any good um, public speaker, not me, I ramble on a lot and I get, I get rightly told off for doing it. A really good public speaker will speak in sentences with little gaps in between because it gives people a chance to digest what they've said before they start making paying attention to the next sentence. We speak in sentences, don't we? If we spoke like this and never have a pause for breath ever and just carried on speaking like this without pausing and just went on and on and on like this, oh, it gives you a headache just hearing it, doesn't it? So we speak in phrases. Make your solos in phrases. So have almost like a little mini sentence and then, um, yeah, and you'll have like a little mini sentence and then you have a little pause. I'll show you what I mean. This is what we don't want. I'll show you what we don't want first. Horrible, isn't it? Right? It's yucky, yucky, yucky. But if I break that up and do little phrases, there's one. Here's another. There's one. There's one. Could be a long one. important and here's one of my favorite tips um, and I'm going to take this one for myself I often reference other people and I'm really honest about it but this is one that I developed myself soloing used to scare the pants off me I used to I used to hate soloing on stage um, and I kind of developed coping mechanisms myself and this is one of them and I think it'll help you right so soloing phrases 
think of a sentence, you could sing it or just say it. It could be the most ridiculous thing in the world and match your notes, not in terms of pitches, just rhythm to that. I'll show you what I mean. You'll think I've gone crazy, but try it yourself in a minute and it works. Okay. I woke up this morning I had some shreddies They were really nice They were yummy and filled me up I washed up my spoon I put it in the dishwasher Cause I'm lazy and I didn't Want to pre-rinse it myself <laughs> Now, if I do that without all the ridiculous words The rhythm right have a go I'm going to play the backing track have a go talk talk to yourself no one else can hear you about what you did first thing in the morning read out some of your shopping list pretend you're talking to someone um, discuss the polit political events from today don't match the melody just match the rhythm of your words Keeping it short, I know you're probably desperate to have a go, but you can try it yourself afterwards. I just want to cover some of these other things. Next one, space, goes to that phrasing as well. Miles Davis was the guy that coined the phrase, that the notes that you don't play are as important as the notes that you do play. So again, just a super quick example. It's almost the same thing, isn't it? If you're using phrasing, you're adding space. But we don't want... just really boring so sometimes even just the sound of two notes with a bit of space afterwards some space into what you're doing the other thing is timing and this is crucial not just your timing in terms of playing in rhythm because if you don't sounds awful right so you've got to have some kind of rhythm to play but as well as that people often forget something really important where you start your solos makes a massive difference or where you start your phrases okay i'm going to play back that backing track and the first, I'm going to play exactly the same phrase the first time I'm going to put it on beat one. You'll see what I mean when I do it. One, two, three, four. Whoops. No. What did I count in? That's weird. Let me try that again. One, two, three, four. play exactly the same thing now I'm going to start it on beat three two three four one two sounds slightly different so the beat that you start your phrase on is really important and so many people at the start of a song or a start of a piece of a start of a verse will hit on beat one but sometimes it sounds so sweet if you push it back a bit. Beat two. One, two. Gives a different feel. So have an experiment with that. Start coming in on a different timing. 
The other thing is rhythm and groove. Um, so we want to kind of create a, an element of groove and that locks into the rhythm, doesn't it? So vary what beat you start on as we're doing already. That goes into the same thing as well. But sometimes um, the emphasis that you put on um, particular beats or particular notes can make a big difference. Again, that sounds quite vague, but if I explain, um, if we think of most music in common time as one, two, three, four, if I hit the one, two, three and four really loud, my um, my solo will sound fairly straight. Here we go. One, two, three and four. Sounds quite straight. If I hit on the ands, one and two and three and four and one and two. Oh, I've, I've done the opposite. I've locked into the beat. That's a really tricky one to show you. But the emphasis that you put on certain beats is really important. So rather than one, two, three, four, try one and two, one and two and three and four. Vary it. I find it really hard to do, but hopefully you'll get an idea. The other thing with groove is just see if you can create little licks. Um, I particularly on blues there's certain ones that I use you don't want to make a cliche but there's certain ones that I use quite often something like that you can get into a groove maybe the same notes that sound really nice in a solo and don't be afraid of repeating them you can lock into some really beautiful grooves and that was the birthplaces uh, that was the birthplace of riffs you think of famous ones by the beatles do 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 day tripper smoke on the water right da 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 so see if you can find these little micro grooves few other things um, that are kind of really nice to have a have a have, a, have an experiment with um, next one articulation so thinking about how you're going to attack um, each notes are you going to do it staccato or are you going to do it smooth so I'm going to go back to my backing track and see um, it can make a big difference have a listen I'm kind of letting the notes run into each other. Whereas if I'm rubbish one there, sorry guys, but that's staccato. articulation think about how you're hitting those notes and vary it sometimes when songs get really exciting you're going to want to you know really dig in right other times you want to keep things nice and relaxed so have a think about your articulation super super um important and pimo is just asking where i get my backing tracks from um literally all i'm doing pimo is finding kind of um little little kind of chord combinations the two five five one chords from any key so in c d minor g7 g fit really well together and i literally this is probably why they sound a bit rubbish but i literally just record myself on voice memo on my ipad um but youtube is your friend right if you go onto youtube and you put backing track in the key of c and a genre You'll come up with endless brilliant backing tracks for jazz stuff i like um 251 backing track in the key of c that'll give you loads of really nice jazzy tracks 
Um, C blues backing track, it'll come up endless C blues backing tracks that you can do your blues scale over the top. YouTube is an amazing resource for, like that. And it's all free. Some of them you have to watch a little advert at the start, but it's all free. Um, so just record yourself on your phone, voice memo, old fashioned tape recorder, and then just play, play over the top, all sorts. Um, yeah, that's free. If you've got um, if you've got an Apple device, iOS, that'll be free as voice memos. And literally, just hit record. You can name your track. Really, really a brilliant resource. But if not, I know you can do YouTube because you're watching on YouTube now. So um, at the end, if I uh, if remind me if I forget anyone, um, and I'll leave some links to some appropriate videos where you could do this. I'm going to finish off two quick ones because I, I feel like um, I, I always get tired between the end of these lessons and I start rambling on and on. But I do want to just mention two more things because it's kind of super important. Next one's tone. Have a think about your tone. This is very similar to articulation, isn't it? Um, what a lot of ukulele players forget to do, and to be honest, I'm going to be really honest and include myself in this. Because I have quite, um, people comment on my, my music is fairly melancholy and I kind of, I do a lot of slow stuff, don't I? I tend to use a lot of a warm tone where I use my thumb to get the, I'll use my thumb to get the notes. And I'll tend to play up here, which we call dolce, the sweet end of things here. And I aim for that warm sound. But say I wanted, I was playing like along to a blues piece and it needed a bit more bite, then I might use my nails to pick. There's your articulation, a bit of a bend. That's a nice example of articulation or a slide. So you can experiment with that. But notice when I went with my nails. The attack is totally different from. The other thing to experiment with is come down this end. We call this the ponte. If you've ever heard ponte, it sounds fancy, doesn't it? Ponte literally means bridge in Italian. And this is our bridge on our ukulele, right? So sometimes, I, even if I'm using my thumb for everything, if I've got a really sweet part of the music where I want it to be really melancholic, I'll play up here. Whoops, sorry. But if I was playing um, a blues piece and I wanted it to really bite, notice the difference in the tone if I go way down here. That's really good if you want to stand out in a crowd. So have a think about taking your thumb back here or fingers if you want to really punch through or if you're playing something really hard. Um, you've probably seen Jake Shimabukro was in England, wasn't he, recently on his local tour. Absolutely just blew my mind when I saw him. But you notice when he's really hammering stuff, he'll quite often come back to Ponte. <laughs> give that really kind of aggressive attack which he puts in some of his pieces so have a think about that one final thing and this is really super important I'm really gutted that I left it to last because it's it, I I should have mentioned it earlier probably because it's one of the most important listening when you play music to when you play to music is like crucially crucially important and it again it's something um we don't do enough of have a listen to the piece of music you're playing to and make sure there's room for you to put certain notes and have a think about where you're playing them. Um, earlier I did another backing track. Thinking about it, I'll, I'll upload these somewhere and put the link in the description because then you can use the exact ones I used here. I just recorded myself singing Betty and Dupree, which is a, a blues jazz number. It'll sound something like this. Have a listen. Have a listen to it. Where can you fit little flourishes or riffs? What I don't want to do is sometimes easier to show you what I don't want, isn't it, than what I do want. What I don't want to do is this. One, two, three, four, 
Because where have the vocals gone, right? They've disappeared, and if you're playing in a band, that would be where the lead vocalist would look over you and give you the evils, right? Try and be sympathetic, listen to music, see where you can fit something. So, for instance, Something like that. Yeah, again, not good. <laughs> I should have practiced that. But it gives you an idea. You can fill in the blanks, fill in those little bits of space and have a listen, kind of react to things. You can match the vocals, but you want to be sympathetic if you do. You want to match the rhythm if you're doing that. But better, let the vocalist speak it. And fill in the gaps afterwards. That would be really good. So one last bit of practice, because I've gone way over. I'll play that one more time. Um, I was using the C blues. Off, three, one, two, three, one, three. Have a little try yourself. I'm going to give you one more example of where those vocals can help. Remember that phrasing earlier where I said you could kind of sing along to what you have for breakfast? If you're playing a piece of music and you get an instrumental break afterwards. Betty Todd Dupree, I want a diamond ring. When you come to the solo, you can match the rhythm of the vocals, but with a different uh, melody. And you'll end up with something really nice. Have a listen. Matching a rhythm. Betty Todd Dupree, I want a diamond ring. Betty Todd Dupree, I find this anything. <laughs> There's your solo. It's just the rhythm to the words. This bit has a few more syllables. There we go. <laughs> I hope that was kind of useful. That extra worksheet that I was talking about, I didn't ever get round to using it. Um, I feel as I went along, um, feel as I went along I was covering a lot of stuff and I thought I didn't want to add any extra complications into it okay so we might come back to this I think at a later live lesson that will give you time to actually learn some of these skills let's do that let's make a promise to each other right if you enjoyed that promise you'll come back when I do the next one might not be the next live lesson we'll come back to it in a few weeks when you've had time to practice you guys practice those scales that i mentioned and then when we come back next time let's just concentrate on this we'll get some really beautiful solos going i think that'd be a really nice thing to do and um, trevor absolutely absolutely an instrumental break should totally relate to the song that's why maybe when i've got an instrumental break for a whole that would cover a whole verse i match quite often match the rhythm of the vocals even if i'm changing the melody and again yeah relate to the song you're playing so in those little kind of little flourishes in between the vocals you can kind of match a similar thing you can even get into a groove with a vocal which would be a really good thing to do a couple of people have mentioned um, using uh, looper pedals to practice, which is a, a really fantastic way to do it. You can just loop tracks using a pedal or you can get some apps on the iPad um, that's really good for that. But as I say, 
just find um, backing tracks on here. There's all sorts you can do. I wonder if I can get one up now if I just put YouTube on. Um, just to show you how easy it is to find them. This is my this is me logging into YouTube. See if it'll work. If it makes the video go f go funny, well we've um, we've we've got a decent way anyway, haven't we? I'm just putting in C blues backing track. Click and return. Look at this, loads of C blues backing tracks. This is one I've used before. You can see the little red bar. Click on it. Let's have a lesson, guys. I'll squeeze it onto the bit where it's actually just the backing track. This is one that's in blue, in C blues. in C blues back in track and I had about 10 15 come up in that moment so really great resource use it it's absolutely absolutely brilliant well I hope you enjoyed that guys um I've run way over today but I think that's cool I wanted to cram as much in as as I could um I normally like to start stop about quarter of an hour before five so I can take questions and answers I'm gonna hang around for a little while longer just because I feel like we've covered a lot of stuff and people might have questions. So um, if you've got any, have a think about it now or forever hold your peace. See if you can think about it. You can always leave them in the comments afterwards and, um, and let me know and I'll do my best to answer it. And as I say, maybe in about a month's time, so maybe not the next lesson, but the live lesson after that, let's come back to soloing. And let's really concentrate on this sheet. So get some of those solos under, under your fingers. Get some of those scales under your fingers. And in terms of the ones to concentrate, major pentatonic, minor pentatonic and blues would be the ones I think to really concentrate in. Because if you think about major pentatonic, the full major scale, you're only adding two more notes and you can learn to fill that in later. So that's, that's, that's easy peasy. The other thing to do, and I promise I'm not just doing this to um, to get you to come along, but some of my students have found it useful to join in with my Canakapila Mondays. So every Monday um, at six o'clock in the evening, so this is good for people who are working in the UK as well, and you can watch these back anytime, just move my head out of the way. Um, I hold something called Canakapila Mondays. And what we do is we learn to play about sheet music. So we take chord structures like 12 bar blues, we're going to look at next time, um, really simple one, four, five pop songs, C, F, G, things like that. And I teach you the song without sheet music so you can play it off by heart, but then I'll always include instrumental breaks for this exact reason so that you can then practice your soloing. So we might play a pop song in the key of C and you'll play C major pentatonic. We might do a blues song in the key of A and you'll do A blues scale. So you can you can kind of take that sheet that I gave you, have it handy on a Monday. And when we get to the gaps in between the, um, the lyrics, you can add your solos. And I think that's really important. Um, so many um, so many groups, so many performers will sing and strum a song all the way through, but they never have an instrumental break. And those instrumental break in popular music, I think they were there for a reason. It gives you variety. It gives you a bit of a break from the singing, doesn't it? It gives you a different timbre and tone and instrument, and it creates a new groove. So it's really important. So if you can start kind of learning to play in the instrumental breaks, I think that's absolutely brilliant if you can do that. Um, so come along to um, my Canakapila Mondays. Um, it's free to take part or you can buy me a virtual cup of tea or coffee if you'd like to. Um, or you can leave me a tip. Which one? <laughs> there. Uh, that's my, um, my PayPal thing where you can drop a tip if you want. But you're not obliged to. If you can't afford to, that is totally cool. Come along completely free and strum along, have some fun, practice your riffs. 
Um, last two times we've been looking at um, kind of pop songs with 16 bars in, but I'm going to go a bit blues in the next one. So I think you might enjoy, if you enjoyed your blues scale, I think you might enjoy Monday coming where we're going to look at blues progressions. And the brilliant thing is so many blues progressions are the same chords uh, over and over, aren't they? So brilliant to practice with. So come along, kind of Kapila Mondays. E that's every Monday. So these live lessons on a Wednesday are every other Wednesday. Um, and the kind of kapila are every, is every Monday. It's a Hawaiian term, kind of kapila, which just means to jam with friends or family. Um, they do it on their, their kind of gardens, on a porch, wherever, community centre. They just get together and play for the joy of it. And that's what I want you guys to do. Fabulous. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stick around just a little bit longer, just in case. As I say, any questions or anything... Just give me a shout. Oh, I haven't been scrolling down. <laughs> There's loads of comments and I haven't been scrolling down. Oh, goodness. I've, I've, you must have thought I was ignoring you all. Oh, thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you. Jo John and uh, Esther are having a conversation. And I love this. This is what I want in the comments. Make it a little community about perhaps thinking about practicing with uh, looper tracks, which is really good. Thanks, Danya. Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> yeah lots to digest oh with a nice cake that would be all right <laughs> purple uh red velvet's my favorite then yeah <laughs> if you ever vis visit the eat cream i'll uh, i'll let you stay extra long if you bring me a red velvet thanks richard thanks jude really good to see you all again absolutely lovely oh my goodness i missed everyone thanks linda there we go thanks richard brilliant um just a reminder as well as I'm looking through some of these um, lovely, lovely comments. Thank you, everyone. Um, that these sessions are going to be available um, for ever after on my YouTube channel. So it's worth subscribing if you haven't already to the channel. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Angela. <laughs> Thanks, Esther. Yeah, the more you do it, the more you get it. Totally. Just keep doing and the more you do, the more you get. Um, the, these video, these are going to be available afterwards. So if you enjoyed this, you want to come back to it. And I think that'd be really useful for this one because there was a lot to take in. Um, you can find all of these either on my YouTube channel under the live little tab. Or um, you can go to my website, which is mattsteadukulele.com. And I've created a, a tab which has my YouTube live lessons. And they're all listed. So if you missed one, you can um, watch it back. If you want to go back and practice, you can find them on there. And they're all chronological. So that's mattsteadukulele.com. And um, I've also got my courses on there. So if you're new to all this and you've just dropped in by accident, there's a 30-part beginner's course, all the videos sequential, taking you right from the start, how to hold the ute to strumming, patterns all that sort of stuff there's an intermediate one taking you on and a ukulele next steps the next level looking at things like chord melodies there's a uke theory course which some of you if you're starting to get into this theory side of things might enjoy and that might clear a few things up and there's one on playing up the dusty end which is i always say you've paid for 20 frets so you might as well use this section so it's all about taking chords up the fretboard making it more interesting they sound great up here <laughs> okay so have a look at that oh thank you so much i the, the, these comments really do mean the world to me because you put this stuff out there and you have no idea if people are going to enjoy it <laughs> and if they think the same way you do and they're going to get much out of it so i really appreciate that it means means a lot so makes makes it all worthwhile thank you guys Thanks, David. Take care, mate. Perhaps see you on this Monday. I love doing the can of Kapila things. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, if anyone is in the UK and they feel like travelling, um, the can of Kapila, I do a Friday session um, at the local pavilion here. It's 2, yeah, 2 30 in the afternoon every Friday. Um, I actually do a live can of Kapila where we have a group session. You can come along and play in a group. So if you want to come along and do it physically with others um, and you live close enough or you happen to be on holiday down here and you want a little ukulele break, come and visit us on a Friday. All right, guys, I've been jabbering on and on and on. 
I've not been speaking in phrases, have I? I've been blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to give your ears a rest and I'm going to give my um, my vocal cords a rest and I'm going to say goodbye now. Thank you so much to everyone who took part. Um, again, I should have said this at the start, not at the end, but um, thank you to everyone that supported me by buying the worksheets, whether it be the £4 or the £8 ones. It really, really helps me to do this in lieu of physical lessons and other things and it helps me to kind of have all the equipment to keep it going and everything so massive thank you to all your support and thanks for those that have sent tips as well i've been really blown away um by people's um, generosity and kindness which is absolutely fantastic i even had um some people sending me a card all the way from canada this, this week and it just oh it just made my week it's absolutely lovely i've got it here somewhere it's got a picture of me there we go have a look at this <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> That's me for my videos. It's magic, easy peasy. Don't worry if it seems hard. <laughs> we'll come back to it much later. And there's the dusty M for you. <laughs> so there we go. Thank you guys. Well, have, have a wonderful week. And um, if I don't see you before, I'll catch you in two weeks time for the next live video. I'll put details up on YouTube soon. Um, if not, perhaps I'll see some of you on Monday evening for Canicopelia. Take care, everyone. I'm signing off.